Hello everyone. My name is Dr. David Peel. I'm a staff scientist at the KAUST Visualization Core Laboratory. Today I'm going to give you a brief demo or a tutorial on how to launch a machine learning training job via Slurm onto the IBEX cluster. Now, um, in this training or tutorial is going to build on two previous uh, training videos that I made. The first on how to get started with Scikit learn uh, with the scikit-learn data science project on ibex which walks you through how to build a conda environment for scikit-learn on ibex uh, and then the second video shows you how to launch a jupyter server on ibex so today i'm going to start by just launching a jupyter server on ibex and then i'm going to use jupyter lab as kind of a, a teaching tool to walk you through the process of launching a training job on ibex so to get started, I've already logged into IBEX, and I have uh, changed directories into the scikit, my scikit-learn data science project directory. And so now I'm ready to launch the Jupyter server. And the details of which, again, I covered in a previous video, but all we need to do is sbatch the launch Jupyter server sbatch script. So this is going to launch the, the Jupyter uh, uh, server as a job onto the debug partition of IBEX. So we can check the progress of this. Okay, so that, uh, that job is running. And just waiting for a few seconds for the Jupyter server to start up. And eventually, um, in the uh, Slurm error file for the job, will be two URLs that you need to copy. Uh, the first is for the port forwarding. So that will be this one here. So I'm just going to copy this, create a new text or a new terminal window, paste and hit enter. So this is just going to create the SSH tunnel uh, between the compute node on IBEX on which my Jupyter server is running and my workstation here where I wish to access the Jupyter uh, server in my browser. So I'll just minimize that. We don't need that anymore. And finally, I go down here and copy the second URL, which points to the Jupyter server running on a particular port on a particular IBEX compute node. This should just take a few more seconds. I'll go ahead and get rid of this. Okay, um, so I went through that process very quickly. Again, there is a, um, a previous video on launching a Jupyter Notebook on IBEX. So if you need to go through those steps a bit more slowly with a bit more detail, I would encourage you to check out that video. Okay, so now I'm going to cover the process of uh, launching a machine learning training job on the IBEX cluster. So before we can actually uh, launch a training job, we need a training script. So in the source directory, I have a, a training script, train.py. So this is a, um, a scikit-learn based uh, training script that basically tra or that trains a classifier on the CIFAR 10 uh, computer vision data set. So I'll just kind of briefly walk you through this script. Uh, the point of this tutorial is not so much to discuss the details of a good scikit-learn training script, but rather to show you the process of just launching a training script as a job on the cluster. In future tutorials, um, I will go through the process of writing a, a very high quality um, advanced uh, training script in scikit-learn. So 
I guess the first thing that I would like to point out is that in the script below, there are no magic numbers, no magic strings um, that are being passed as inputs into the various functions in the script. All of those things have been gathered into the top of the script and defined as global variables. So I think this is an important best practice uh, for both keeping track of the things that are potentially changing um, and driving the uh, results of your model, um, but it also makes it easier to make your training script more flexible in that we can eventually expose these uh, global variables as actually arguments to the script. And there'll be a future training video on how to use a, a Python standard library package called argparse to do exactly that. So by collecting them at the top of the script, we're kind of preparing ourselves for improving our scripts going forward. The next part of the script actually downloads the data. So it uses the uh, fetch open ML uh, function uh, to fetch a particular data set, in this case, the CIFAR 10 data set, and return the result as a data frame. Um, and then we, to avoid having to download that data set again and again as part of our job script, we go ahead and use a library called joblib to actually dump a serialized version of that uh, data set straight to disk inside a particular directory. Um, and then once that data set has been cached on disk, future training jobs will just uh, read in the data from the copy that's cached on disk. Uh, next, I do some standard train test splitting. Um, in any kind of classification problem, you could always have an, an issue of there being an imbalanced number of, of class observations uh, in your training set. So I do stratified sampling to make sure that the distribution of the uh, different classes is the same in the training set and in the test set. Um, next, I create a scikit-learn pipeline. Pipeline just has uh, three stages to kind of demonstrate the, the concept of a pipeline. It has a pre-processing stage where we rescale the, um, the pixel values, uh, which are integers, and rescale them to put them as floating point numbers between zero and one. So this helps many um, machine learning algorithms converge uh, a bit better. Next, I kind of reduce the dimensionality of this feature space from well over 3,000 uh, features for the CIFAR 10 data set um, using principal components analysis. And then finally, I use a random forest classifier to train, um, train a model, a classification model based on data. And I'll talk about um, you know, all of these different uh, inputs to these functions in some later uh, in some later videos where we focus more heavily on the, the training script itself. Um, I picked the random forest classifier because it's a it's a good benchmark. It's relatively fast and it scales really well. Um, okay. Then I uh, actually train the pipeline. So this step up here is basically just creating a pipeline. This happens, you know, mostly instantaneously. This step could take a while, um, depending on the size of the data set and complexity of the model, things like that. Um, once we have finished fitting the training data set, then we dump the trained model to disk. And this allows us to, to avoid having to retrain this model again if we want to uh, perhaps do some hyperparameter tuning. We could have a separate script for doing hyperparameter tuning and start from a trained model and then do hyperparameter tuning based on uh, using that trained model as a starting point, just as an example. And finally, I make some predictions and then just generate a classification report based on those predictions. So, okay, so that's the train.py training script. Now I want to go back to the bin directory and look at um, two other scripts. So the first is going to be our uh, train.sbatch script. So this is, um, if you've come to any of the 
the IBEX 101 trainings uh, offered by my colleagues at the Cal Supercomputing Lab. Um, they will have give, shown you some examples of these SBATCH scripts or these Slurm job submission scripts. So the Slurm job submission script can be broken down into um, three kind of components which are going to show up in most all of your job scripts. So the first is the Slurm headers. So the Slurm headers is where you uh, request the amount of resources that you need for your job. So this uh, SBATCH uh, script is requesting uh, four CPUs, four times nine is 36 uh, gigs of memory for two hours with an additional constraint that the CPUs need to be Intel CPUs. Now this additional constraint is important in our case because we specifically built our Conda environment to be optimized for Intel CPUs. So if we try to run this Conda environment on non-Intel CPUs, um, jobs might fail uh, or we might get very odd results. So we want to make sure that we request specifically Intel uh, CPUs. Now, the, uh, you might wonder why we're asking for nine gigs of memory per CPU. Uh, the reason that I'm asking for nine gigs of memory is that each of our Intel CPU nodes has um, roughly 366 gigs of memory um, available for 40 CPU cores per node. So for, uh, 366 divided by 40 is a little more than nine gigs of memory per CPU, so I, I round it down to nine. So this helps make sure that as we scale the number of CPUs, we're proportionately scaling the amount of memory. And this is relevant for, um, for a few reasons. Um, but the most important of which for scikit-learn jobs is as you um, do more advanced um, scikit-learn based workflows using hyperparameter tuning or um, cross-validation as part of your training process, these uh, under the hood, these are using um, Python multiprocessing um, of some form or another. And uh, this typically has significantly uh, more memory requirements as you expand the number of CPUs. So we want to make sure that our memory is expanding uh, with the number of CPUs that we're asking for, but expanding in a way that is in some sense fair. And that if you're asking for, you know, four cores, um, if you're asking for, you know, four out of the 40 cores, that's 10% of the cores, then you should get uh, about 10% of the memory, which is about 36 gigs, and so on and so forth. Uh, I requested four CPUs um, just as kind of a, a place to start. So four CPUs is pretty common on a, on, on a good laptop these days. Um, so I thought that was a reasonable place to start. Um, and also the many of the algorithms in scikit-learn, but not all, are um, inherently uh, parallelizable and have already been parallelized um, and will take advantage of as many courses that are available by default. So generally you're going to be requesting more than one CPU per task for your scikit-learn training jobs, um, but you also don't want to request, you know, a whole node's worth of scikit-learn of, of CPUs for your scikit-learn training job unless you know and have benchmarked that your training script is scaling well as you increase the number of, of cores. So four is a pretty good place to start. And I've requested two hours of time. So two hours is the um, kind of the maximum amount of time uh, that you can get on debug node. And it's also about the minimum amount of time that I tend to request from my batch jobs. Um, I don't see that requesting less than two hours is getting my, or gets my jobs to run any faster. Um, but obviously, if you know that your job is going to finish in less than two hours, then you might consider lowering that to some number less than two hours. Okay. Uh, the second important point is this kind of bash uh, tip or trick, which is to use the set-e command, which will ensure that your, your job will stop if there is an error in any of the commands in this script. 
And that's important because typically if we start a training job um, and something goes wrong with one of the commands, it probably means that everything else after that is going to be garbage uh, and we don't want it. So rather than waste time kind of going through all the additional steps in the script, we should probably just fail immediately and end our job and release the resources so that we can start again. So that's what this set-e will do. Uh, the next major section is just activating the Conda environment itself. So I like to do a module purge just to make sure that I haven't, um, that there aren't any mo modules that I might have inadvertently loaded um, interactively on IBEX before uh, launching my job that might um, interfere with my Conda environment. So I do a module purge um, and then a conda activate command, the typical command to activate your environment. It's very important to make sure that your Slurm job scripts are running as uh, login shells. That's why this first, uh, the first line of your uh, job submission script should be uh, bin bash login to make sure that it runs as a login shell. And that's what will enable this conda activate command to work. If you do not run your your job scripts as login shells, then the conda activate command is not going to work in the way that you expect. Finally, we launch the training script itself. And here we take advantage of this special bash variable dollar sign one. Now, if you've come along to the introduction to shell for data science um, workshop that uh, we put on at KVL, uh, you will be familiar with what this uh, special bash variable does it actually passes the first argument that you pass into this script and replaces the dollar sign one with whatever that value is. So we're going to use this as a mechanism to pass in the training script that we want to use um, into this job submission script. So this is going to allow us to um, reuse this same job submission script for many different training jobs. So nothing else to say about that. So the next script I want to point out is the launch-train.shell script. So it's always a good idea to wrap the actual process of submitting your training jobs in a wrapper script. In this case, uh, launch-train is what I'm using as an example. So the reason that this is a best practice is that often you're going to have some kind of you know, project maintenance or bookkeeping tasks that you're going to want to do before you launch a job, like setting a job name, maybe creating a separate directory for each job, um, things like that. Um, and a launcher, a wrapper script is a good place to automate those processes. It's also very useful because as your workflows become more uh, advanced or sophisticated, and you start doing things like hyperparameter tuning or job dependencies where you want to launch different um, jobs depending on the outcome of previous jobs, all of that logic will end up in this wrapper script. And so these wrapper scripts can kind of grow over time and add additional complexity and, and automating all of that, which will really uh, be a, a boost for your productivity uh, going forward. And as we kind of develop and do more um, more training videos, we'll show ever increasingly advanced examples of this. So you'll kind of get the idea as we go along. Okay. So now I've covered um, the different components of the, the training job. So now we actually want to launch the training job. So um, before we do, but before we do that um, as a batch job, I'm going to go ahead and run it interactively just to show you kind of how that process will work. So if we go back to our, um, our launcher window, we can uh, open a Python console. And inside the Python console, we can actually run our training script. So in this case, it's source and uh, train.py. So now the, the data set is starting to download. So if we go to our training data set, so we had this uh, data set name, which would be downloaded to 
the data directory with the dataset name dot job lib. Um, and so once the download is complete, we should see in this folder here a sifr 10joblib uh, file. By running this interactively, we're also um, you know, testing that the script is going to, is, is going to work, um, which is something that I would do if this was a larger uh, training job that might take um, you know, many hours or potentially days to finish, then I would find a way to, um, you know, to debug a smaller version of the same problem, something that could run in the order of, you know, a few minutes or maybe tens of minutes um, in order to test that things are working properly before I launch the big training job on Ibex. In this case, it's also going to cache the data set on disk. So when we run the training job as a batch job, it will run much faster because it won't have to go through and download the, the data set um, from the internet. So now we're just going to have a bit of an awkward silence while we wait for this downloading process to complete. And we're done. So here is that uh, that joblib file, and now we're starting the the training pipeline. So we've gone through, we did the train test split, we created the pipeline, and now the uh, pipeline training is is going on. And one of the things that you'll see here is that um, the, well, I'll, go, I'll wait until this is done and then I'll go back up and explain what's going on. Oop. We have a uh, file not found. Hmm. I wonder why that is the case. Not the file name. Hmm. So we have a results, ah, because that, uh, that directory was not created. Ah, ha, <laughs> yes, I see what I've done here. So yes, this directory has not been created. And the reason that it's not been created is that um, it will be created when you actually launch the, uh, the wrapper script. So the wrapper script defines the directory in which the result should be um, should be saved into, and uh, and then creates that directory. So I actually need to manually do that here in order for the the training script to uh, work as planned. So I will just create a new directory called example uh, training job, and just in case you um, you're uh, unfamiliar with the make dir command, this dash p on the make, make dir command will uh, check to see if the directory already exists and then just it um, don't th it doesn't throw an error and just moves on um, if the directory already exists, basically. So that, that part is important. So the fact that I've created this script, this job, bleh, this directory manually, isn't going to cause any problems when we run this script um, as a batch job.
Okay, so let's uh, let's do this again. So now there should be no need to download the data set. So we'll go straight to the starting the training pipeline. Go back here. So we had already downloaded the data set. So we just loaded it um, from the file, did our train test split again, and our uh, define the pipeline, and now we're doing the training. Then when this training is complete, I will go and explain um, a little bit about the output that you're seeing here. Okay, cool. So let's talk about the output that we've that we've seen here now that the, the training script is finished. So if you scroll back up to the top, so for okay, so I guess first off, why do we have why are we building a hundred trees? Well the reason that we're building a hundred trees is that the random forest classifier is, is an ensemble model that builds a uh, a collection of decision trees that are each slightly different from one another and then uh, uses the parameters of these different decision trees, trains those to train the model, and then when it uh, produces predictions, it, it creates a, an average prediction over all those decision trees. And we specify, um, the by default, the number of uh, decision trees for the random forest classifier is, uh, is 100. Now that's a key hyperparameter for any random forest classifier and one that we'll look at in future training videos on hyperparameter optimization. So that's why we're training 100 trees. Now if we look at, um, we see that we at parallel n jobs equals minus one and then we have four concurrent workers. So what does that mean? So by default, um, the number of uh, the random forest classifier will use all available core, all available cores to train um, to train these different uh, decision trees. So in this case, we have four available cores, and we can tell Scikit-Learn to use all of them by just specifying minus one as the number of jobs, and so that's actually what gets passed in here. So basically, we will use four cores for training a hundred different uh, uh, decision trees as part of our random forest classifier. Now, if you had access to a full hundred cores, you could train each of these decision trees in parallel and speed up your classification or the, the training step significantly. That's one of the benefits of using a random forest classifier. It scales very well with the amount of resources out available. Now, of course, we don't have a single node on which you could train a random forest classifier with uh, 100, uh, 100 cores. So you'd have to do something even more sophisticated, like bring in Dask to train, uh, to get access to a full 100 cores to train your random forest classifier. That's a yet more advanced example. Um, what else? So, I think if there's any other important uh, information that I should mention about this output before we launch the job as a batch job. Um, boom. I guess just, so here's the, this is the classification report here. So you're getting precision recall and the F1 score, uh, which are just three, um, uh, three common classification metrics for each of the different classes, the 10 classes that we're uh, trying to predict in the CIFAR 10 data set. Um, this, you know, default untuned model does okay. You know, definitely not great by any stretch, um, but definitely better than a random benchmark would do given that there's 10 classes which are, you know, roughly equally um, 
distributed, then you, know, you expect about 10% accuracy for a random guess. So this is doing significantly better than a random guess, but you know, not, uh, not great by, uh, by the standards of the day for sure. Okay. Okay, so now we want to launch this job as, as a, a batch job. Okay. So to do that, we can um, open a terminal and now we can actually launch a bat this batch job um, on the cluster from within what is essentially this other batch job where our Jupyter server is running. So to do that, uh, all we need to do is run our, uh, our wrapper script. So launch train. And now that we've launched that wrapper script, and again, inside the wrapper script, we basically you know, do some bookkeeping and then call sbatch to launch the training script. And again, this is the path to the training script that's being passed in as an argument to our sbatch script. So if we go back here, we can look at the, uh, the jobs that, that we're running. So we have this um, Jupyter server that's running in the debug queue where we're doing our interactive work. And then we have this batch job here, which is still pending. And we're not asking for too many resources. So I would guess that this job will start running uh, fairly quickly. Um, at least I hope so, because I don't want there to be any kind of long, awkward pauses in this video. So we can do S control show job ID and then I think this is the syntax. So we can look here and see when um, when it's going to start. So we have no estimated start time. So that's another, uh, I guess, slurm tip. S control show job ID and your job ID will help you understand more about what's going on with your job. So let's see. Still pending. Hmm. We'll wait a little bit while longer and then maybe I will cancel it and then try reducing the the time limit to be less than uh, less than two hours I know that the this training script is going to run in you know you know less than a few minutes so that might help the the job get going faster nope oh, it's already running now okay so if we go into the results directory, so here's the slurm error and the slurm output. Um, and this is the job lib file that we created when we ran this uh, interactively. And um, in a minute, that file is gonna get overwritten. Oh, there we go. Um, by the result from the training job that we just ran as a batch job. So that means that this job is probably done um, um, so the fact that this shows up as last modified as being seconds ago tells me that this job is probably done. So if I check the queue, in fact, I will see that the only job running under this user is the Jupyter server that is running on the debug partition. Okay. So now if we go and we look at our files, um, if we look at the error file, so the error file, um, has, uh, some of the output from, uh, from scikit-learn. Basically, all of the uh, the logging of the different tasks uh, and things like that that are being uh, generated by the different workers, and when those tasks are done, gets logged to the error file. And then, if we look at the output file, we get some of the the details from the random forest classifier, 
building of different trees and things like this. Um, and then at the bottom, we will get the uh, the uh, classification report. Um, ah, one other thing I forgot to mention uh, back in the training script is that you can control the amount of output um, that the scikit-learn algorithms will generate by changing this verbosity level. So the verbosity uh, gets passed into your random forest classifier, so it controls how much information from the classifier is logged out. The bigger number, the bigger the number you put, the more stuff is going to get printed out. Um, and then sometimes different algorithms will have a verbose flag, which you can just set to true to turn on logging, um, which is the case for this uh, make pipeline function. There's a verbose option that you can set that to true. Okay. So, so that's it. So just to recap, we, I, I walked you through a, a basic scikit-learn training script. I talked about um, a Slurm job submission script and the different components of that. And then I showed you the importance of wrapping that Slurm job submission up into an SBatch script, uh, or sorry, into a, um, a, launch, uh, a launcher script. Uh, and this is a basic example of that, but as you start doing more advanced workflows, uh, you'll find that a lot of, of your job launching procedures is going to get captured in this in this script. Um, we have our slurm.out, our slurm.error files. And then I also showed you how to, um, you know, working within an interactive JupyterLab server, we were also able to then go and launch batch jobs for machine learning training and that allows us to then come back and we can continue developing other training jobs that we might want to launch as batch jobs. So using Jupyter Server as an IDE, an integrated development environment on Ibex is kind of my typical uh, workflow. So I do a lot of interactive work and then I launch batch jobs for my heavier, uh, more compute intensive jobs. Okay, so I think that's it. I don't have anything else. Um, so hopefully, you learned a good bit about how to launch jobs on uh, on ibex um, please feedback is always appreciated um, in the uh, and on our youtube channel so please you know like and subscribe and all of that and if there are any particular uh, topics you would like us to cover then just please let us know um, either via email or slack uh, just reach out to us and you know we can help provide little training videos to, to get you unstuck if you're stuck with doing data science and machine learning on iOS. Okay, bye for now.